So as the panel members are coming up, um, I'll, I'll just give a little bit of framing for this. So the title of this panel is The Future of HSE Scholarship, A Look Around the Corner. And uh, what we've asked the panelists to do is uh, to think about the following questions. What are some of the most pressing issues facing healthcare and consequently health sciences education now and in the future? How might research and scholarship in HSE contribute? And what directions for research and scholarship in the field of HSE do you see as filled with promise to inform the future? Now, we have four panelists. I'm going to introduce them very briefly. Um, and uh, I see uh, Chris Watling, uh, who is uh, Acting Vice Dean Education Scholarship and Strategy, Director of uh, the Center for Education Research and Innovation, a faculty scholar at the uh, Schulich, School, Cent Schulich School of Medicine, sorry, in, at Western uh, University in London. Uh, Chris is a neurologist. He has a PhD in uh, health professions education. Uh, and his research has focused recently on coaching, on feedback, on professional culture. And the other thing about Chris is he's, he's avid about teaching people how to write. So I, I think we can all thank him for that. He comes to us supported by the Menard and Anna Gertler Visiting Scholars uh, Program Fund, so thanks for that. Next we have uh, Joanne Alfieri. She's Assistant Dean of Curricula, Postgraduate Medical Education here at McGill, and in uh, the Department of Oncology, she's Associate Chair for Education, an Associate Member of the IHSE. She has a Master's in Medical Education and is the Residency Program Director for Radiation Oncology. And her interests are in teaching innovation through the use of e-learning and virtual patients and uh, feedback-seeking behaviors. Next, Meredith Young, who's an Associate Professor and the Associate Director of Research in the Institute of Health Sciences Education. Uh, she earned her PhD in cognitive psychology, studying how we think. That's kind of scary, actually. Actually, how we think through complex problems in medicine. And her research interests now include clinical reasoning, assessment and validity, meta scholarship, and uh, health professions education. And her work helps to us to understand key concepts in health professions education so that we can have a productive dialogue to support teaching, assessment, and scholarly practice. And last but not least, uh, Jerry Freed, who's an Associate Dean, Education Technology and Innovation, Director of our uh, SIM Center, a surgeon who is uh, Chair of Surgery, and an Associate uh, Member of uh, the IHSE. He, uh, amongst other things, has reinvented the graduate program in experimental surgery. And looking through his CV, he had so many awards, I can't even say how many. He's been recognized uh, widely. His current research uh, focuses on surgical simulation, the application of artificial intelligence, and quality improvement. Now, I gave you the questions that were given to our speakers. Their challenge is not in answering the questions. Their challenge is in answering the questions in four minutes. And there's going to be an alarm, which sounds like that. Sorry about that. And uh, I'll give you a little bit of warning before it's alarm time. Then we'll have 10 minutes for questions and comments. And then you'll have all the evening after that where you can grab them and discuss things in further detail. So without further ado, Chris, please go ahead. Okay, thank you, Linda. It's a daunting task, four minutes. Um, so um, looking into the future is a pretty fraught exercise. Uh, I think the last few years have made me and probably many of you uh, pretty humble about trying to predict what the future holds. Um, but I will uh, offer a few thoughts, four thoughts, about what I think um, lies ahead for health sciences education uh, and the scholarship that accompanies it. Um, the first, the first, <laughs> put it by your mouth. The first is, um, I finished medical school in 1990. I believe that much of what I learned has become obsolete. 
I, I was going to say virtually all. I think that might be going a bit far, but so much of it has become obsolete. And that, uh, the pace of that kind of change has accelerated. So we don't just need to train people to be adaptable to that. We really need to figure out a way of better embedding lifelong approaches to learning uh, in um, medicine and across the health professions. Um, every time something new happens, at least in medicine, we try to cram it into the four years of undergraduate medical training uh, as if that's going to make all the difference. And in fact, we really need to create organizations and systems where people can learn throughout their careers and, uh, and not feel that that's a threatening act. The second thing, building on something that uh, the Dean uh, said, uh, when you think about the rise of AI and ChatGPT and all the rest of it, it raises for me a really existential question. What is a health professional anyway in 10 or 20 years? Uh, what are we even here for? What do we bring to the table when we're no longer the holders of knowledge and that's all dem democratically available at the touch of a button? I really think that uh, we are here to provide um, guidance, interpretation, empathy, compassion, and we need to be really thoughtful about how we select and train people for those tasks, those things that only human beings, I hope only human beings, can bring to the table uh, into the future. Um, the third thing I think is a bit related to that, you know, with the democratization of knowledge and the wide availability of knowledge, um, comes the potential for this kind of sea of misinformation surrounding us. I think in a lot of ways science is under threat. The public faith in science and in healthcare science is eroding. And I think we really need to think about how we train our scholarship on making sure that health professionals of tomorrow can communicate effectively and convincingly with the public, um, can help to build and rebuild the trust in science and in healthcare, and maybe engage patients and the community better in the way that we educate. And then the last thing I want to say is that I think that we have two quite effective but um, not very often communicating groups of people in uh, the Canadian landscape. One are the people that make education policy. They do great work. And the other is the people that do education, scholarship and research. They do great work, but they often don't do it together. Uh, and I think that in the future we need to be much more thoughtful about how we bring researchers and policymakers together. When researchers are sitting next to policymakers, they understand what the really pressing problems are and they can think about how they direct their research around that. And when policymakers are sitting with researchers at the table, they sometimes get more creative ideas and they sometimes are able to make, I think, smarter choices about the ways forward informed by an understanding of what the research tells them. So I'm going to stop there. Wow, I'm impressed. Thank you. Um, we'll hold questions till later, and uh, I would like to go to Joanne next. Thank you very much, uh, Linda. I, I want to say that I agree with everything that you've said so far. Uh, obviously, I, al uh, I also want to add to the list of things that are sort of demanding our attention in uh, health professions education. The first being um, the necessity for incorporating the principles of equity, diversity, inclusion, and accessibility to really ensure that underrepresented groups are accessing and ha have access to training programs and our education. Uh, also to promote cultural humility amongst uh, healthcare professionals. But also since the Dean and Chris has alluded already to AI, um, you know, I think AI is wonderful and it's here to stay and it's a bit scary sometimes. But what we really need to understand and learn and research is that AI models are really as unbiased as the data sets that they're trained on. And so we um, can look to those data sets and make sure they're free from bias and represent um, the diversity of the population that we care for. Uh, my second point uh, was leveraging technological advances uh, to really improve patient outcomes and patient safety. Um, as we know, like during the pandemic, uh, telemedicine has really taken off, remote monitoring of patients, etc. And I just wanted to highlight one project that's being done here locally by PhD, uh, PhD student Antoine Chablac Bruyard, who's actually in the room, I believe. I sit on the supervisory committee. And um, 
this project is so important. It's looking at the implementation of technology within a complex uh, care network, a cancer care network, looking specifically at e um, sort of electronic patient reported outcomes and its integration within that team. And I think we know that the um, technology, technological innovations often fail at the implementation stage. And so we need to understand what that means and why uh, they do so within the context of where healthcare is actually delivered. The third point that I wanted to uh, bring to this group is uh, translational research to bridge the gap between biomedical sciences and clinical practice. I think the re research to practice gap has long since been identified. Um, but, and because really graduate students, graduate science students are not um, often given that opportunity. The infrastructure is not there for them to have conversations, uh, have those interdisciplinary conversations with clinicians to be able to bring uh, research into the clinic. And so I've had the opportunity to be involved in a really exciting project led by Terry Abair and his students, which and a newly minted graduate certificate in uh, biomedical um, translational research. Um, and this uh, certificate is really aiming to bridge that gap. And what I'm so excited about uh, in terms of this program is that it includes a large element of clinical mentorship, which is uh, so important for, uh, for those network building opportunities. My fourth point is interprofessional education as a means of improve, uh, improving uh, patient outcomes and patient safety. So interprofessional education has already been proven to improve patient outcomes and lead to better collaboration and patient-centered care. Uh, but there's still huge barriers that remain. And I think those barriers include um, the traditional health professions education program structure, mm -hmm. and also the lack of resources um, and support for those activities. And uh, the, the lack of resources is not only funding, sometimes it's also time, giving the students time in their curriculum to, uh, yes, <laughs> I got the look, I'm so scared of Linda. <laughs> um, uh, so, my last point, uh, last but certainly not least, uh, which is demanding our attention, is the very high level of burnout rates in healthcare professionals. Uh, I think resiliency training through mentorship and uh, support uh, and coaching is an important part of resiliency training, and research in this direction is definitely what's needed. From my own research on feedback and trainees, the relationship between the teacher and the learner and the trust uh, in that relationship was highlighted as the most critical element and so our research in the direction on how to foster that and look at outcomes such as decreased burnout rates and um, uh, job satisfaction would be the way for the future. Thank you. Thank you. Meredith, I, I think we're in a credit of about four seconds now. So oh, I'll burn it. Okay. <laughs> Everybody here who knows me knows I'm good at talking. Um, I want to thank you guys all for being here. It means a lot that you've come. And I wanted to frame my thoughts and my time actually by borrowing a conceptual model from a different discipline. And I thought it was apt, because people who know health sciences education know that we're an import-export business. We're a very mixed group. We bring disciplinary scholars from lots of different fields in contact with enthusiastic educators, with administrators, with policymakers, and magic happens. And if you want to get to know a little bit about the variety that's within the field, I definitely invite you guys to spend some time getting to know our PhD students. They're phenomenal and have deep and varied expertise. But the model that I wanted to use to frame my comments is something called the triple loop learning model. It's out of organizational learning. <clears throat> and fundamentally, the model is really, really simple. It's the notion that if there's a problem and we try to fix it, we can learn in three different and unique ways. So if we need to fix a problem, we first innovate to fix the problem. We cr come up with new solutions, new innovations, we implement them and make sure they're working. So that's our single loop learning. How did we fix the problem and did it fix? Once we've done that, we can pause, loop back, and go back and think about the systems and structures that generated that problem in the first place. Are there ways to tweak, adapt, adjust our systems and structures in a way that will prevent that problem from happening again? That's our double loop learning. After that, we can pause again and say, well, hold on a second. What is it about our systems and structures that generated this problem? Because systems and structures are based on values, 
and are made by decisions. So are there anything within the decisions or the values that created these systems and structures that need to be reconsidered? This is our triple loop. So fundamentally, single loop learning asks, are we doing things right? Double loop learning asks, are we doing the right things? Triple loop learning asks, who gets to decide what's right? And are we okay with that? So I find this model really helpful because it, it hits the breadth of work that's done in health sciences education and particularly in the IHSC. A bunch of our scholarship is about innovating important and creative solutions to problems that are imminent and need to be fixed now. Some of our scholarship is around how to better understand the systems and structures that generated these problems, whether education systems or healthcare systems. Triple loop learning and some of our scholarship suggests that we need to kind of take a minute and figure out if how we're doing what we're doing reflects the values that we intend or whether we're replicating something that needs to be taken apart. So that's a little bit more critical work, but it's super important and definitely needed in times of constant change, which we're in right now. So I think it's a really interesting model to help think through the breadth of work that we do, the importance that we do, and also the place that we hold in both educational and healthcare practice conversations. And why I think it's really hard to know what's coming. So we are asked to think about what's coming down the pipeline or what's around the corner, and I'm horrible at predictions, so if you ever have a chance to gamble against me, please take it. Um, and I think nothing in the last three years has taught us any different, right? We're living in a world that was only part of science fiction several years ago. So I think that we're well suited to, to, to deal with whatever's around the corner, so long as we keep asking these three different types of questions. Are we doing what's right? Are we doing it the right way? And is this the right that we want to make sure happens again? And the interesting thing about triple loop learning is if we're not doing the right thing, or if the system needs to be reconsidered, it gives us a very specific language for change, and it actually tells us that if it needs to change, we're the ones to do it. So thank you for your time. Thank you. All right. Um, Jerry, you actually have a credit of 24 seconds. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I, I hope I won't use it, but so I'm a surgeon, as, uh, uh, as Linda said, and I, unlike all the other people, really have not had formal training in education. So I admit this up front. So this is my challenge. I really have become very interested in surgery as a performance field and how we should teach surgeons and how should we assess them to make sure they are safe to go out and operate on you or your loved ones. Now, let's stop for a moment. Can you imagine getting your driver's license without ever taking a test where you actually drive a car, merge into traffic, park, etc.? Probably would be uneasy about that. Well, let's think about certification of surgeons. Certification of surgeons was really based on a period of training after which you undergo a multiple choice written exam and an oral exam. And those, those um, evaluations were reasonably good at uh, assessing your knowledge and perhaps your judgment. But in fact, there was no formal way to assess skill. And what actually gets done in the operating room is important for patient safety and outcomes. When the uh, advent of minimally invasive surgery or laparoscopy came in the early 90s, I had the challenge of training a whole generation of surgeons from across the country, and it was obvious that there were some people that were unsafe uh, to practice, but we did not have any uh, way to arbitrarily determine which people should get the certificate that they took our course and which didn't. So this led us to develop a simulation to model the fundamental skills of laparoscopic surgery and to develop metrics in order to assess performance of these skills. And over a period of time, we acquired enough evidence that we were able to show that what we measured in the simulator was predictive of performance in the operating room. And performance in the operating room was a challenge to measure in itself, and we could talk about that. And that training in, in the simulator was extraordinarily efficient at improving the skill level. Based on this uh, evidence, we then worked with two large um, multinational specialty organizations to develop a program called the Fundamentals of Laparoscopic Surgery, and then developed a relation or a, a goal of influencing health policy. And ultimately, we were able to change the certification process for surgeons and subsequently for obstetricians and gynecologists such that they were required to pass a test 
developed here at McGill um, with, uh, uh, to, to demonstrate their performance, uh, not only their knowledge and skills. The challenge is that although simulation training is really good and effective, it's, it's difficult to organize logistically, it's expensive, it takes a lot of time. So our, our subsequent goal is really to look at how do we optimize this time through a blended learning approach, incorporating online, interactive, multimedia-rich education, and the use of more novel technologies such as uh, virtual, augmented, and mixed realities. And quite interestingly, just last week we were able to train a, a surgeon 8,800 kilometers away in real time to perform a life-saving operation. And we believe that this technology will allow us to access people in remote areas to help them perform uh, life-saving procedures. Finally, the, my most recent area is the use of artificial intelligence, namely computer vision, to extract data from videos of what we do in the operating room to really provide evidence of which techniques are related to the best outcomes. And armed with this knowledge, develop educational models that will ensure that surgeons learn the most optimal um, methods that are measured in the performance of what's often a black box, what goes on in the operating room, and really that this will inform the practice of surgery for the future. Thank you. So thank you to all. We now have some time for comments or questions. Uh, if you have a comment or question, there is a microphone here, or you can put up your hand and maybe we can send around, oh, well, I guess Nicole's gonna take around the mic. While uh, we're doing that, I, I'll just comment by saying, I think all of you talked about how HSE and HSE research informs and is informed by uh, both the education and then by extension, the system in which things happen. And uh, it, from four different perspectives, I think we've seen the importance of health science education uh, scholarship. While I'm looking for hands, maybe uh, would any of you like to comment on any of the other things for very briefly? Chris? I gonna, oh, I, go, I go ahead. The mic is working. I was going to mention something that might, I don't know, you probably already know, Chris, but um, Chad GPT was uh, tested on um, responses from physicians um, at an Ask Docs subreddit sort of group. And they looked at 200 responses from physicians and, they, uh, and the responses from Chat GPT. And they, unsurprisingly, uh, the robot did better on um, the clinical knowledge part but also did 10 times better on the empathy part. So it's a bit scary <laughs> when you say compassion. Although, and yeah. Although I gotta say, in, so, we're looking at medical students, they did better, Chat GPT did better on the knowledge part, but not on the complex reasoning part. That's There's another study. <laughs> that's reassuring. I, I, I would say it's, um, if we're honest, this is not so surprising, and it's really, really disappointing. Um, but, <clears throat> But I, I don't know if the rest of you are like me. I've found that when I or my family interact with healthcare, often I end up disappointed with the interaction. Um, and uh, on occasion, I've had a patient say to me, um, wow, that was such a great, you're the first doctor that's really listened to me. And I, you know, I, I think it's actually disappointing to hear that people call out being listened to as the exception to the rule of their experiences with healthcare. And so when we say that ChatGPT outperforms doctors in terms of empathy, I think that's because we've set our bar too low. And, and I, I find this very frustrating because we've been talking about this since long before I was in medical school and trying to train people in how important this is. And this keeps happening again and again. So I think that's a real thing that we need to reckon with as we, as we uh, look forward. Thank you. Could you identify yourself and then? Benaro, um, pediatric surgery. Um, just to stay a little bit on the technology side in terms of future for IHSC, all these jokes, the chat GPT jokes and the, and, this, and the whole AI newfangleness, the reality is that in 2023, we are facing what people call a singularity 
an inflection in the progression of our society, which will never leave it the same way it was. And that has to do with AI, indeed. And I'm just wondering, on Friday, there is a, the CFAC, which is the French Aso Academic um, Association in Montreal, in, of Quebec, um, has an entire symposium on how to train healthcare professionals in AI because they realize that it just has to be done and we, the educators, need to do it. I'm just wondering what are the specifics at the IHSC, at IHSC level that um, we're ready to, to take this on. Linda's looking at me. <laughs> so I'll at least take the first crack. Sometimes my role in these things is just to talk until other people get their thoughts sorted. Um, <laughs> And that's fine. Everyone needs a job. Um, I think one of the things that comes to mind around the conversations around new developments in AI, ChatGPT, um, visual detection software, stuff like that, is every time there dis there's a disruption, for me it's a space for reconsideration, right? So there was a study released a few weeks ago, it's gotten a lot of press, where ChatGPT outperformed medical students on the USMLE licensing exam. It spooked a lot of people. For me, it was like, fantastic, we can finally talk about that exam, right? Because if, if a knowledge-based exam is Googleable, then maybe we need to think about how, how we're testing, right? So the, these moments and these techniques allow space both for disruption and for careful reconsideration. The hard part is they happen fast, and the careful reconsideration often takes time. But we have fantastic public service organizations deeply embedded in the ethics of AI, um, both in terms of ownership, um, data in, data out, in terms of the, the deep racialized tendencies in a lot of our softwares. Like even the automatic sinks in the airport won't recognize a certain level of melatonin because they were never trained to, right? So I think these moments of disruption, if done well, are fantastic opportunities for reconsideration and not just patchwork. So our habit is to kind of pick and patch because it's necessary, but I think we don't want to go so quickly we don't get a chance to think deeply about it. I'd like to ask a, Chris, a, a question of Chris in terms of the uh, medical students in empathy or the physicians in empathy. Um, is it that we're not teaching them properly or are we selecting the wrong people for medical school? Because, you know, we are, we've been so academic performance uh, biased that, in fact, bad doctors are not people that are not smart enough. Bad nurses are not people that are not smart enough. They're people that lack characteristics. And although we've evolved our application process, I think that we don't, um, fo you know, focus enough on that. That's a good research question. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what I was going to say. That's 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 why you have an institute to uh, to to try to explore those questions in a meaningful way. I, I I don't know the answer to that. I do think that we probably need to recognize that historic approaches to selection may not serve our needs very well into the future, and that we might have to reconsider that. I think a chronic frustration in selection is that relatively few things have ever been shown to be particularly usefully predictive of how people are going to perform. Um, we sort of settle for academic performance because it's better than anything else that we have, but it's not very good at predicting those things like, um, you know, uh, compassionate, empathic interactions with, with people. It's good about predicting whether or not you'll be able to withstand the, the academic rigors of medical school. So I think we badly need uh, more creative approaches to selection, and I think we need research around them to try to help us to know how to do better in the future. Thank you. Dr. Wiseman. So thank you for this discussion. A lot of the topics that are brought up are very close to my heart. One, um, a lot of what I'm hearing deals with what I would call technological pedagogical skills. Do we know how to teach with technology? Do we know how to create technology that helps us teach what we really want to teach? The second thing, and I, you know, the point about empathy, that's like one of the most important things, I would argue, and that's where we require human beings, right? The danger here is that if we don't develop our technological, pedagogical skills, we'll have these teaching machines where we teach people whatever we put in the machine. But if we leave out the empathy, 
we're teaching them the wrong way. And there are models of this. Nodding's concept of the caring educator. Uh, Nodding, I think, should have won a Nobel Prize for what she did. And she argued that you don't have to teach somebody any curriculum. The curriculum is not important. It's the learner and the patient that are important. And if you can, tr if you can develop or negotiate with a patient and a learner the concept of mutual caring, the patient and the learner will be able to learn at warp speed using whatever technology they have. So I see that as the future, all the more so since I just heard that we are going to double the admissions to our medical school class. Is that true? Only a 37% increase. 37%, so 37% increase, I should not exaggerate. Well, the problem is I, I have a feeling that it's not enough so that we're going to be faced as educational researchers and as educators with a tsunami of learners and we risk reaching for technology, not thinking about it or knowing what we're doing. And I'm afraid that empathy, which is seen to take time, might go out the window with that. So that's a great thing to work on in the future. Thank, Thank you, you, Jeff. So I think there's time for one person to respond to that, uh, if any of you would like to. Don't fight over it. Go ahead, Joanne. Um, no, I mean, I just want to say that I, I totally agree with Jeff. And I think that what came to mind as he was making his comment was um, the issues that, that were seen uh, around my research with the feedback in, in postgraduate trainees, which uh, was really a difficulty, maybe not a dif maybe difficulty is the wrong word, but a lack of um, trust and relationship between trainee and supervisor. And what I found very interesting is that there's a lot of focus in the curriculum on patient-doctor relationship and alliance. And maybe we need to also focus on patient-teacher alliance and relationship. And so that, that just came to mind as you were speaking. Learner-teacher or patient? Sorry, uh, learner-teacher. Sorry, okay. I misspoke. So, um, I think we could keep talking about this for the next three hours, and you will have a chance to talk about this uh, after our next few speakers. But I would like to, on behalf of all of us, thank you for a very insightful look uh, at into the future and around the corner. So please join me in thanking our panelists.